In this video, we're going to review the rules for adding and subtracting when we have fractions. The most important rule to remember for adding and subtracting fractions is that you must have a common denominator. Uh, okay. Now, what is a denominator again? Remember, the denominator is the bottom of a fraction. The top number we call the numerator, the bottom number the denominator. Now, as long as you have a common denominator, the rules aren't too bad. What we want to do is we want to add or subtract the tops, whatever we're supposed to be doing in the problem. So add or subtract the numerator, and then keep the denominator the same. So for example, in problem number one, in both of these fractions, they have a denominator of 5, so we're okay to add. We add the tops, 2 plus 1 gives me 3, and we keep the denominator the same, and so my solution there is 3 fifths. For the next problem here, again, we have a common denominator. They both have a denominator of 10, so we can add the numerators. 3 plus 7 gives me 10, and we keep the denominator the same. Now. If you ever end up with a fraction that um, has values that will go into both the top and the bottom, we want to be able to reduce the fraction. So we're looking for things that would divide into both the top and the bottom. In this case, we could divide the top and the bottom each by 10. We end up with 1 over 1, and we can just divide that, which is just 1. Uh, for problem number 3, again, we already have a common denominator, which is 20. That's great. In this case, we have 7 plus negative 13. Uh, remember your rules for adding integers we just talked about. So in this case, um, the signs are different, so we need to subtract. That gives us 6, and we want to keep the sign of the bigger number, which is in this case is going to be a negative. So we have negative 6 over 20. Now, when we're dealing with values with fractions, again, we want to see, can my fraction be simplified? In this case, I could divide both the top and the bottom by 2, making this a little bit simpler. When I divide 6 by 2, I get 3. When I divide 20 by 2, I get 10. And then don't forget that you had a negative value. So my answer is going to end up being negative 3 tenths. Now, a couple of words about negatives. You can have a negative on the top of a fraction, you can have a negative on the bottom of the fraction, or you can write the negative out in front of the fraction, and those all mean exactly the same thing. So just kind of keep that in mind as you go. All right. Now, what do you do if you don't have a common denominator? Uh, that's the case down here in problem number 4. Notice that here we have a 5, here we have a 4. We, uh, since the denominators aren't the same, we're stuck. So job number one, if you don't have a common denominator, is to rewrite your fractions so they do have a common denominator. When you look for a common denominator, what you're trying to find is a number that both of these will go into evenly. So in this case, with 5 and 4, if I choose the number 20, notice that to get from 5 to 20, I could times by 4. And over here, to get from 4 to 20, I could times by 5. And that's going to allow me to rewrite this problem in a new way. All we're doing is kind of this, we're reverse simplifying, where before we divided by the same thing on the top and the bottom. Here we have to times by the same thing on the top and the bottom. So 5 times 4 gives me 20, so I also have to do 3 times 4, and that gives me 12. 3 fifths and 20, 12 over 20 are exactly the same fraction. There was a subtraction between them. Then here, to get from 4 to 20, I had to times by 5, so I'm going to have to times the top by 5 as well. 1 times 5 gives me 5, and now I have an equivalent subtraction problem that I can actually do now because they have a common denominator. So now we do just what we did in the last problem. We Now that the denominators are the same, add or subtract the tops. In this case, 12 minus 5 will give me 7 on top, and we keep the denominator on the bottom. Uh, in this case, there's nothing that will go into both 7 and 20, so I'm finished, and I keep that as my final solution. Let's do a couple other examples here. Uh, here, between 6 and 8, again, not a common denominator, so job number one <coughs> is to come up with a common denominator for both of those numbers. Now, a common denominator that will always work, you can get by multiplying these two fractions together, kind of like 5 times 4 gave me 20. That's always going to work. 
In this case, we could do that, and we could rewrite both of these fractions with 48 as the denominator. However, there's actually a smaller number that will work in this particular case because they share some factors, and it's always nice if you can keep your fractions a little bit smaller. It saves some of the simplifying at the end and just makes it so people make fewer mistakes. My little rule of how I try to get a common denominator is I start with whatever my biggest number is. So in this case, it's 8. And then I just start looking at each of the multiples of 8 and see if the other number goes into it. So for example, 6 does not go into 8, so then I look at the next multiple of 8, which is 16. 6 does not go into 16 evenly, so 16 won't work. Um, then I go to the next multiple of 8, so uh, 8, 16, the next one's 24, and 6 does go into 24, so I can use 24 as a common denominator. It's a little bit smaller than 48, keeping the fraction smaller makes it just a little bit easier to do all of the operations. Now, remember, when you rewrite with a common denominator, you've changed the problem, so you have to change the top of the fraction as well so the fractions are equivalent. Here, to get from 6 to 24, I had to times by 4, so I have to times the top by 4. 20 times 4, or sorry, 5 times 4 gives me 20. In this next one, I have to get from 8 to 24, so I'd have to times by 3, so I need to times the top by 3, and 1 times 3 gives me 3. Now I have an equivalent fraction, or equivalent set of fractions that are being added, and I can do it now because they have a common denominator. So I add the tops, 20 plus 3 gives me 23, and I keep the denominator the same, and my solution is 23 over 24. Again, do a quick check to see if you can simplify your, your, uh, your final answer. In this case, there's nothing that will go into both of those values, so I'm done. In problem number six, we have to do negative three-sevenths minus five. Well, this is a little bit of a problem because I have a fraction here, but no fraction here. So the best way to get around that is to go ahead and write five as a fraction. And remember, you can write any number as a fraction by putting it over one. So I can think of this as negative three over seven minus five over one. Now, when I compare my denominators, they are not the same. So the first thing I need to do is rewrite them with a common denominator. I can do my same trick here. 7 is my biggest number, and um, I can get this fraction here to be 7 by multiplying the, den the, uh, the bottom by 7. So in this first problem, at, with negative 3 sevenths, I didn't have to change anything at all, so I'm just going to keep it as negative 3 sevenths. Bring the subtraction along for the right. Now I have to rewrite 5 with 7 on the bottom. To get from 1 to 7, I had to times the bottom by 7. So to get from 5 uh, to this new top, I have to times the top by 5. So here I have 35 over 7. Notice again, this kind of reduces down to be 5. Uh, so I, I, everything's equal and I haven't really changed much. So now I have an equivalent set of fractions. Um, but the nice thing about this new set is that now I can, in fact, actually do the subtraction. So when I go to do this one, I can I start out and I have to do the, what it says on the top. Here I have negative 3 minus 35. Again, don't forget about those positive and negative rules. We like to change subtraction to addition and then change the sign of the value that comes after it. So to do negative 3 minus 35, I really want to do negative 3 plus negative 35. Signs are the same, so I add those together and I end up with negative 38 on top over 7. And check to see um, if this particular fraction can be reduced. 7 does not go into 38 at all, so this is as simplified as it can get. Now, notice this is not, uh, this is what we call an improper fraction. That is, the number on the top is bigger than the number on the bottom. Uh, and depending on instructors and different ways that you've learned this, you may have wanted to try to change improper fractions back into mixed numbers for your final answer. And you can certainly do that. The way that you do that is you take 7 and see how many times it actually does go into negative 38. Um, and in this case, 7 would go in evenly 5 times, because 7 times 5 is 35. And then I'd have 3 leftovers. Um, to get from 35, 36, 37, 38, I'd have three leftovers that would still have that sevenths in terms of the denominator. So you're picking out whole groups of seven and rewriting that in this particular way. Now, to be honest, for the purposes of this class, leaving things as improper fractions really is okay. And in a lot of ways, it's preferable if you have additional mathematical operations that you need to do. Um, 
and we'll see why here um, as we get a little bit farther in these problems. Um, but as long as your answer is reduced, oftentimes this answer in this form is sufficient unless the problem specifically says that you need to write your answer as a mixed number. Um, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and look at multiplying and dividing fractions in the next video.